All right. Now keep your finger here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We will be coming right back to it. So don't lose your place, but I want you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter number 2. What we're preaching about tonight is Scripture. It's the Holy Scripture. What is Scripture? Some attributes about the Scripture. And of course, I'll be going into a little bit about why we're King James only and, and showing a difference in what people call Scripture and how it shouldn't even be called Scripture because of the attributes. But we're going to be going into that tonight. So, um, you know, the first, the first question, well, what, it, what even is Scripture? What does that word even mean? The word is very simply, it's, it's a writing. It's something that's written down, a Scripture. Now, normally, uh, it's in context of the Bible. The Bible is God's Word written down. Um, so the word script is where the word scripture comes from. If you think of a script, um, you get a script from your doctor. What is it? It's, it's, it's him writing out a prescription for your prescription. Again, that, that root word of script is, is for writing. That's all it means. I mean, it's real simple. So the scripture is writing. What well, I want to show you something here from John chapter 2. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in, build, in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. And what I want to point out here is that they're, they're making a distinction between the scripture and what Jesus said, because at this time, these words weren't written down yet. The Gospel of John wasn't written down yet. When he rose again from the dead, they remembered. First of all, they remembered the Scripture. They remembered the Old Testament that prophesied of Jesus Christ's resurrection. And they remembered what Jesus had said unto them. And I'm just making the point is that, you know, obviously at this time it became Scripture. You know, these words that Jesus said unto them, are currently scripture they just weren't at the time because they weren't written down so what we have is god's word that's written down but see this is very important to understand this as well because scripture is given by inspiration of god and scripture is what we rely on for all of our matters of what we believe, our faith, how we practice our faith, you know, the congregating of the church. All of this stuff is based in Scripture. It's based in God's Word. We have what's been passed down throughout the generations as written down, ultimately stemming from the mouth of God. It's God's breathed Word, but written down so that we can still have it today. But it's the Scripture. And... <clears throat> Go back, if you would, to 2 Timothy 3, if you kept your place there. We're going to look at the end of the passage here. The Bible says in verse 15, this is the Apostle Paul, of course, writing unto Timothy. He says, "...in that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus." Obviously, the scripture is extremely important. This is the, the foundation of our belief is found in the scripture. Jesus, the Bible says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then later on it says the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the, of the Father. And um, Jesus Christ is the Word. Just as much as you need Jesus Christ to be saved, to have that eternal life, you need the Word of God. We need the Scripture in order to be saved. And he explains that right here. He's saying, you know, the Scripture is able to make you wise unto salvation. We need the scripture in order to then put your faith on Christ. You need to hear God's word. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This scripture is integral in your personal salvation. You cannot have it without the word of God, which is why I'm preaching an entire sermon about scripture so that we know, you know, th this is extremely important. One of the most important things that we, that we have is the scripture. It's just as important as Jesus because it is Jesus. Not the physical pages, but the, the words contained on these pages is Jesus Christ. He is that word made flesh. But let's keep reading in 2 Timothy 3. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, All Scripture 
is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So in verse 15, it's talking about salvation. And then in verse 16, it's telling us, hey, everything in Scripture, all Scripture, is profitable for doctrine. We can learn from it. We get our teachings from Scripture. It's profitable for reproving people, for telling people that they're wrong. It's profitable for correction, for correcting ourselves so that we can get right with God. It comes from the Scripture for instruction in righteous. How do we live a right life? What are we supposed to do? What are our instructions? They're found in the Scripture. Now, Understanding Scripture and making sure that what we are reading is Scripture is extremely important since that is how we're wise unto salvation and all Scripture is profitable for doctrine. So if you have different writings, so from here on out, when I talk about Scripture, I'm not just talking about a writing. We're talking about the Scripture. We're talking about the Holy Scripture that would be recognized as God's Word as given to us by God. So if you have multiple writings and you're going to call it Scripture, it better all be profitable for doctrine. It better all be accurate. It better all be correct because if it's incorrect, it's not profitable for doctrine. If you have a book and, and you're going to say, well, this actually isn't right. Oh, this isn't supposed to be there. Oh, we need to make a change here. That's not profitable for doctrine. That's not profitable for instruction, for correction, for saying this is the way it is, thus saith the Lord, if there's mistakes, if there's errors. That's not Scripture. That's not God's Word because God doesn't make any mistakes. So if you have different writings and they say different things, you better determine which one, what's scripture and what's not. We need to understand this. We need to know what's true. And it's critical to understand it. And we're going to see some evidence here too. Now, it was interesting because I looked up the word scripture or scriptures, you know, singular, plural in the Bible. And the vast majority of the time that it's just used within the context, it's referring to prophecies that were fulfilled about Jesus Christ because the New Testament is a lot more references to the word scripture because in the New Testament none of the New Testament was written when these things were going on none of it was I mean we get the, the benefit of having the whole thing already written down in scripture for us today but as these events are going on they did have scripture they had God's writing it was all the Old Testament they had all the old prophets they had the Mosaic law they had everything else that was their scripture and because Jesus Christ was prophesied and all these events were prophesied in the scripture, that is why they're referring to the scripture. That's why they're saying, you know, and that's why the majority of the references are them saying, oh, and then we remembered it was, you know, it was written in the scripture that this had to happen or that happened. And this was done to fulfill the scripture that um, whatever, you know, when Jesus Christ was crucified, when he rose again from that, all, all the different um, prophecies that are fulfilled, they're tied in with scripture. And proving in itself that it's God's word because it's true it's coming to pass it was it was talked about thousands of years ago hundreds of years ago thousands of years however long it's been for the particular passage the particular scripture when it comes to pass you know for a fact that's God's word because it came to pass and nothing is left undone in the scripture you know, nothing was, is prophesied in Scripture as, oh, this was supposed to happen, but it didn't. There are no lies in Scripture. There's nothing that, that is prophesied that, that isn't true. And there's nothing that's written in Scripture that is false. It, it is the truth. The Bible is, you know, the Word of God is truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. And the truth's what make us free. Um, it's, it's, I love how it all just fits together. Um, So we need to understand the attributes of Scripture to make sure that what we are reading actually is Scripture. So once we know the attributes, I kind of went over them already, but we're going to see this a little bit from the Bible. Um, you know, Scripture is truth. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the Word made flesh. Um, Daniel 10.21, you have to turn. Let's turn, if you would, to um, Psalm 12. Daniel 10.21 says, But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth 
and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael your prince. So you're talking about the scripture of truth. And that's what, what the Bible is. It's the scripture of truth. Because everything that's written in it is true. Now, we study and preach the Bible because it is the scripture of truth. That's, why, that's what we're all about. I mean, if you haven't noticed, the name of our church is Word of Truth Baptist Church because that's what we care about. We, the people that get congregated here, all we care about is the truth, knowing the truth, and preaching the truth. That's what we care about. It doesn't matter if it's pleasant. If it, I mean, if it's pleasant, great. We love it. And you know what? If it's not pleasant, great. We still love it because it's truth. Amen. Because it comes from God. And that's what we're interested in. I don't want to be told a bunch of lies. I don't want a bunch of deceivings and someone tell me, hey, yeah, everything's fine. Just go out and live a wicked life and you don't have to do anything for God and you're just fine. And why don't you just focus on making a bunch of money and making yourself real comfortable in your house and everything's just great. I don't want someone to lie to me because at the end of my life, what's going to happen? Everything I did is going to be burned up and it's going to be meaningless and nothing. All because someone lied to me. All because it felt good at the time. Oh yeah, I didn't get pressured into doing anything. Oh man, I didn't, you know, I didn't get I didn't want to get convicted about anything, so I just wasted my entire life. And I was not pleasing unto God. No, I want to know what the truth is. The only way you can please God is by knowing what He wants you to do, is by knowing the truth from the scripture. But again, if you have two books. And they both claim to be scripture, but they're telling you two different things. They can't both be the scripture of truth. They can't. Not if they're saying something different. And I'm not talking about the areas. People say, oh, they say basically the same thing. And you know what? I'll give you that. And in, 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 in many places, you can look at it and be like, okay, yeah, that's basically saying the same thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when there's, there's clear differences in the words, in what they're saying, whether it be a number, whether it be anything. I mean... I was looking up, you know, kind of trying to find the, the naysayers, and it's easy to find where people are trying to say there's contradictions in the Bible and everything else like that. What's really interesting, though, what, what I found, and I'm, I don't really want to get too much into this, but they talk about how many chariots uh, stalls did Solomon have. And... You know, there's, the four, there's one reference that talks about 4,000, another one that says 40,000. And people say, see, that's an error. That's a mistake in the King James Bible, because in one place it says 4,000, and in another place it says 40,000. And they'll say, see, the Bible can't be true. There's an error there. That's not God's word. Man-made mistake. And what the new versions do that claim to be Scripture is they say, yes, this was a mistake, so they change it because they don't understand it because someone deceived them and tricked them into thinking that, oh yeah, this isn't even right. This is untrue. And it just comes from a lack of understanding what the verse is talking about. In those particular, that particular instance, what it's just talking about, you have to read the text very carefully. One is talking about stalls for his horses and the other one's talking about stalls for his chariots and horses. The one that's the lesser number, 4,000, is the one where he's talking about for his chariots. And I mean, if you think of a chariot, it's a lot bigger than just a horse. So he has 40,000 stalls for horses, but 4,000 stalls for a chariot and his horses. Very, I mean, it's very, if you just look at it carefully. But when someone just comes to you and see, they, what they get you to do is focus on the number. Look, the number says this here, the number says that there. And they get you focused on the wrong thing. So you don't need to be focused on a number. You need to be focused on what is it talking about. Is it really the same thing? Is it the same subject? It's not. It's very similar. They both reference horses. They both reference chariots. But that's not, they're, they're talking about two different things. And what the new versions do, they change it. They say, yep, we corrected an error. We made it right. And by thinking they made it right, by changing it, they just made it wrong. They just changed the scripture. They just changed God's word to say something that it didn't originally say and that the manuscripts don't even say, but they say this must have been a scribe's error. Even though we have these words that say this in these older languages, in the Hebrew, in the Greek, it says this, but that can't be right because I don't understand how that could be right. So I'm just going to change it. And this is the attitude that the new versions follow. You start changing God's word. That is not scripture because it's not truth. The truth is the 40,000 and 4,000 in the King James Bible is correct. Yep. That's true. That is right. 
These new versions, that's incorrect. But uh, you know, I don't want. There's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of things like that where where the newer versions have have gone and changed God's word to try to reconcile these supposed contradictions. But what they want to do is try to get you to think that God's word has been corrupted. They want you to think, well, how can we possibly still have God's true word today? I mean, it's been translated into another language. Man, that was so long ago. It was 2,000 years ago. Our old, you know, the oldest even manuscript evidence, the, old, the oldest pieces of paper that we have or, or pieces of writing are, are only go back to like a few hundred years after Christ. And man, a few hundred years after Christ, that's a long time. And that is a long time. It's a few hundred years. But they're trying to get you to doubt the authenticity and the truth in God's Scripture. And to me, is it really that difficult to believe that the Scripture has not been corrupted? I mean, wouldn't you agree that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Word? Do you believe that His flesh saw no corruption for three days and three nights when He was, when he was dead? When His body was in the tomb? Hey, the Bible says His flesh saw no corruption. Do you believe that? Because I do. Because it's written in the Bible. His body was preserved. Jesus Christ is the Word. I believe He is still preserved for us today. The knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Scripture is preserved for us today. Why do I believe that? Just because I just want to believe that? Because I've just used logic to interpret this? No, because of what Psalm 12 says. Look at Psalm 12 if you turn there. Verse number 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God is in charge of preserving his words. Man is not in charge of preserving God's word. God is. If man were in charge and God just left man completely alone to do it, would man screw up? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he probably would. There probably would be a bunch of mistakes. But if God's the one who made the promise saying that he's going to preserve them, and, and in this psalm, David's saying, hey, you're going to preserve your word from this generation and forever. Not just for this generation, forever. They're preserved. Then I believe that. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. I'll read from you from Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Another problem. Yeah, see, I don't just make this stuff up. I believe it because the Bible says so. Because it's written in Scripture and it's been promised to be preserved in Scripture that we have the pure word of God. Because they are pure words and they've been preserved by God. Isaiah 59, look at verse number 21. We see yet another promise. Because some people, I've seen this recently on Psalm 12, well, they'll try to say that, oh, thou shalt keep them, because it uses that pronoun, them. They say that's not talking about the words that's talking about the people. And when you read the context, it's talking about you know, these, these people. They're saying God's going to preserve them. But that's not true. It's talking about the words. And um, you know, again, I'm not going to get into that too deep. You can study it out for yourself a little bit later. But um, we have this promise. But even if you wanted to throw this one out and say, you know what, that's, that's not what that's saying. Okay, Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. Now, did the Lord say that? If he didn't say that, it's not scripture, first of all. Just anytime you see in the Bible, thus saith the Lord, God said this, this is what God said. He either said it or he didn't. And I don't want to read a book of lies. If it's not what God said, then I don't want to read it. And if I have any reason to believe that the scripture that I'm reading is not really scripture, it's not from God, then I don't want to read it. But let's keep going. He says, My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth nor out of the mouth of thy seed which is their children nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed saith the Lord from henceforth and forever. He says, From now and forever these words that I put in your mouth they're not going to depart out of your mouth, out of your children's mouth, out of their children's mouth forever. If there is a break in this at all, it would not be true. 
it would not be scripture if, there, if, if, if God's word stopped. But it didn't stop. It's continued all the way up till 2015. And guess what? It's going to continue forever because that's what the scripture says. Now, the scriptures must be fulfilled because they are truth. So when there's a prophecy, when there's a prophetic statement in the, in the scripture, in order for it to truly be scripture, it has to be fulfilled. It has to come to pass because it's truth. Mark 14, 49 says, I was daily with you in the temple teaching and ye took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. This was Jesus Christ when they came to arrest him in Garden of Gethsemane saying, look, I was there every day in the temple and you didn't do anything. You didn't arrest me. Why didn't you arrest me then? He says, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. It was already been foreordained. It's already been prophesied. It's already been written. This has to happen because it's scripture, because it's been written down, because it's coming from God. God is the source. Scripture is also inerrant. That means it is without error. There is no falsehood in it. There's no contradictions found in the scripture. John 10, 35 says, If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. You know, marvel ye that, that I'm called, I don't have this in my notes, that, that I am the son of God, that I said that I am the son of God. That's what he said. But he's saying that the scripture cannot be broken. You cannot take scripture and just say, oh yeah, that just wasn't true. Oh yeah, the, or, or this is just a contradiction. God said this, but that's not really what he meant. No, it can't be broken. Now, God's word, in order for, it, in order for what we're reading to be scripture, there cannot be a contradiction found within the pages of this book. It can't. That would have to mean then that at least one of the places is not scripture. At the very least, that's what it would have to mean. If you say, okay, well, I'm reading this and it's saying one thing here and another thing there and it's found within the pages of, of the text. Now, I created a list of inherent contradictions within the NIV and I pick on the NIV often because it's, it's the most popular Bible that's out there. Um, but... I didn't, I didn't verify this against the other new ones, but in general, what's in the NIV essentially will probably be found in all of the other ones. Um, and I have a, a few examples here I want to go through. And I don't, there's probably some in here that you've never heard before. Um, but these are always good to know. This is one way I like to show somebody why they have a false Bible. There's many different approaches to this. One way is to put them side by side, and you can see, hey, you know, I always show Acts 8.37. Where is it? You can look at it, hey, it says 36, and then it says 38. Where is 37? Well, what's supposed to be in there? I don't know. Let's look at the, look, another version. Let's look at the King James. And then you can put them side by side and be like, well, should this be in there or not? I don't know. There's a difference. That at least gets somebody questioning it. But what I like doing, and I do this often, I've done this recently with the Jehovah's Witnesses, is I like to show them even out of their own Bible where there's a contradiction. Where is this wrong? And I've, I've gone over this before and I'll say things like, who's the Savior? They all say Jesus Christ. I have not yet heard one Jehovah's Witness not give me the answer of Jesus Christ. Who's the Savior? Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go to Isaiah 43 or Isaiah 45, either one. They both say... Um, and you can look it up for yourself. I don't have all the references here because I wasn't going to go here, but the Bible says, um, you know, I even I am the Lord, you know, in, in their verse is Jehovah, and beside me there is no Savior. He says, I am the Savior, and beside me there is no Savior. So who's the Savior? Is it Jehovah or is it Jesus? They've got a contradiction. What about when you go to Isaiah 9, 6, because the Bible says, there, even their corrupt version will say, um, when it gives the names of the son, you know, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called um, Wonderful Counselor, the Prince of Peace, and it says the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. So a son is born that's called the Everlasting Father, but that's not Jehovah, that's not God the Father, that's the Son. 
Why is he called the Everlasting Father? Well, for me, there's no contradiction because there's something called the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. No contradiction at all. Those three are one. Jehovah's Witness, you got a problem. Or you ask him, how many gods do you believe? How many gods do you think there are? Well, there's only one God. Let's go to John 1. John 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. Their Bible says, and the Word was a God. Well, how many gods are there, Jehovah's Witness? Well, there's just one. Well, is Jesus a God? Well, yeah, but how many gods are there? Another contradiction. Now, when the Bible talks about gods, it's, it, it's very clear it's referring to devils. And I'll say that. I say, well, the Bible talks about these other gods. Yeah, I said, and they're all fake gods. They're false gods that people worship, and they're actually referred to as devils. Was Jesus a devil? Was Jesus a false god? They've got nothing to say that. And see, this is what I like to do, is to, is to approach people, because I want them to be thinking, and they do need to doubt what they believe and whatever, but if they're using a false version, even if it's not Jehovah's Witness, if you got someone reading an NIV, for example, they need to see that they can't even trust their own. They say, oh, well, this is just easier to read. I mean, it's the same thing. It's still God's Word, right? I mean, it's still Scripture. It's just a little bit easier for me to understand. That's the argument people like to make. Look, if you would, um, you could follow along if you want. We're going to be comparing 1 Corinthians 2 and Isaiah 64. You could follow along in the King James just so you can see what it says here, how there isn't a contradiction, but I'm going to read them for you. But what I'm really focusing on is the contradiction within the NIV itself. These are areas where if you just check these verses out, you automatically just have inherently a, a contradiction within the pages of its, of its own book where it just can't be true. And I stumbled along this one a few months ago. I don't remember how I came up with this, but um, in the King James, 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And that's a great promise. You're thinking, wow, how amazing is that? You know, we can't even understand what God has prepared for those that love him. He has got something worked out for us, and we can't even imagine what it is. It's going to be so great what God has prepared for them that love him. And I noticed this one. It says, oh, but as it is written. Where does that come from? Where does it come from in the Old Testament? Well, you know where it comes from? Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64 verse 4 says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. So it's saying the same thing. It's the same quote. He's saying God has prepared something for us that we haven't seen, we haven't heard, we don't know about it. He says, beside thee, you know, because God knows. God has seen it. God knows what he's prepared for us, but we haven't. In the NIV, 1 Corinthians, um, well, here, I'll, I'll read Isaiah 64 first. Isaiah 64 says, Since ancient times no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Wait a minute. He says, No eye has seen any God besides you. So he's saying, So no one, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you. So say no one's heard of another God, no one's seen another God who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. We got a little problem there, but look at what's interesting then in 1 Corinthians 2 in the NIV, it says, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. So there it's right. You know, it, it lines up with, well, no one has known. But if you, when you look that up in Isaiah 64, it says no one has seen any God beside him. So the quote is wrong. And the way they try to fix this is they shorten the quote because they put it in quotes, even though it's all the same verse. They put it in quotes in the NIV. So it says, 
They start off what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, and then they just end the quote. Like, however, as it is written, and then he, and he quotes that fragment of the quote that doesn't even make any sense standing on its own. Why would they only quote? But this is how they try to reconcile the differences, the contradiction, is they just say, oh, well, he was just quoting that one part and then just added his own to that quote and completely changed the meaning of the text that he's referencing. Completely changed it from being any God to being something for us. It doesn't make any sense. It's an inherent contradiction within the pages of the NIV itself. 1 Corinthians 2 and Isaiah 64. Now, I understand this is something that might take a little bit of time explaining with somebody, but if you have a family or friend or loved one or even someone at the door, if they're willing to spend enough time with you, these are important things to be able to show them and to really break down as to why the NIV is false. This can't be Scripture. This isn't from God having these types of mistakes. This is gross negligence. And this isn't just negligence, it's an attack. But I'm not going to even dig into that too much because that's what I believe, but I'm not going to prove that to you today from Scripture how Satan has attacked God's Word and that these are not unintentional mistakes. Because this is, this is bad. This is really bad. If you're going to find, and I started doing this then, trying to find where prophecies were come true and I started looking back to see. I mean, if you're going to be doing a work on like the Bible and you're referencing a quotation It's a serious undertaking when you're dealing with the Word of God. I would think that you would, you would take the time to check these things. I know that I would. And you know what? They did check it because they moved the quotes. But they still just have this, this lie, this untruth in there that doesn't make any sense to have it quoted that way. Another example, Psalm 41 and John 13. In the King James, John 13, 18 says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Psalm 41, 9 says, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted which did eat of my bread hath lifted up his heel against me. Same thing. That's the King James Version, of course. Psalm 41.9 in the NIV, Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. Okay? They said instead of lifting up his heel against me, they changed that into turning against me, which you can say basically they mean the same thing. I'm not even going to argue that point. Fine. John 13.18 in the NIV says, I am not referring to all of you. I know those who I, I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. Okay, well, they've kept that part consistent. But what's interesting here is the footnotes. Because the footnotes in the NIV, I mean, you can't get an NIV without the footnotes. They have to be there because they have to explain all these different changes and stuff they made. The Psalm 41 footnote says, Psalm 41, Hebrew, the he meaning the Hebrew text has... Lifted up his heel. None of the texts say they've turned against him. And then when you look up John 13, it says the Greek has lifted up his heel. So they've changed it in both places, but it's like, why are you just changing the text? Like, this is what the text says. They're even saying in the footnotes, the text says he's lifted up his heel. But we're just going to change it to turn against him. Doesn't make any sense. It's not script. They're taking the scripture. Right? The scripture is the Old Testament writing. The scripture is the writing that's been passed on. They're taking the scripture and they're changing it. They're saying in the footnote, well, it really said this, but we're putting this in here. It's a corruption of scripture. This is the man-made book, the NIV. That is where you get the corruption of God's word, which it's not even God's word after you corrupt it. Another example, and I found this interesting too, because in, now in the, uh, in, in the older versions of the NIV, 
it used to say one thing and now they've changed it and it because I was looking I was I was copying and pasting these verses from the internet so I, I think I'm getting the the newest version probably that that's updated for the NIV um, but in 2nd Samuel 21 19 and this one you, you've probably heard this one before it says in another battle with the Philistines at Gob Elhanan son of Jair the Bethlehemite killed the brother of Goliath the Gittite who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. But in the older version of the NIV, it doesn't say the brother of. It says that Elhanan, son of Jair the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite. Kill Go now, does anyone here remember who killed Goliath the giant? I mean, it's kind of a famous story. Elizabeth, do you remember who killed Goliath? David. David did. My, my five-year-old knows who killed Goliath. Yet the NIV at least used to say that Elhanan, the son of Jair, killed Goliath. And in the notes, it says, in the notes of this new NIV where I got this quote from, it says, Hebrew does not have the brother of. So they're saying that the original text, the scripture, does not say the brother of, which means it says that Elhanan, the son of Jair, killed Goliath but we're gonna put the brother of in there because too many people realize this is a contradiction and they're gonna tell you well the scripture doesn't say that but this is how they deal deceitfully this is how they lie because they look foolish when they come out with a book that says oh this you know this person killed Goliath when the Bible says that David killed Goliath. And it's very clear. And, um, you know, they claim that the scripture doesn't have it, but it does. It, it is in the original scripture, but the, what they're using as their scripture doesn't have it. Mark chapter 1. Another somewhat common um, error that people uh, know about in the NIV. Mark chapter 1 in the NIV says, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths from. Very famous uh, portion of scripture. But they say it's written in Isaiah the prophet. But guess what? You'll not find anywhere in Isaiah the prophet I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way that quote is taken from Malachi chapter 3 and then the second ver portion of that where it says a voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord make straight paths for him that comes from Isaiah 40 now the King James Bible says as it is written in the prophets Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The, the King James Bible is very clear. Hey, this is in the prophets, plural. It's not just from one book. The NIV says, hey, this is written in Isaiah. So if the NIV, if this is going to be called scripture, and it says, hey, this is written in Isaiah, and it's not written in Isaiah, that's not scripture. That's a lie. This is a, this is a blatant lie saying that, hey, Isaiah the prophet said this, and it's not found in Scripture. Or no, not even that he said it, as it is written in Isaiah. They're not even claiming he just said it. They're saying, no, this is written in that book of Isaiah. And it's not there. It doesn't exist. That's a lie. Last place, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 and Galatians 4. Hebrews 11 in the NIV says, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Does anyone know how many sons Abraham had, when, at least when Isaac was being offered up as a sacrifice? Because I'll tell you what, he didn't only have one. Remember, he had a child from Hagar, his, his handmaid. So to say his one and only son 
is incorrect. He had two. Ishmael was his son as well. He was not, Isaac was not his one and only son. Even in the NIV, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 22, it says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. Well, in Hebrews 11, it says he had one and only son. And in Galatians 4, it says he had two sons. Which one is it, NIV? And you're going to claim that this is Scripture, that this is the Word of God? King James Bible in Hebrews 11 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Not that he was his only son, but it was the son, the only son that he had of whom it was said in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That was who the promises was made to and it was only made unto Isaac, not made unto Ishmael. That is who he offered up. And again, it's very clear from the reading in the King James that that is, that is absolutely accurate and it does not mean or say his one and only son. But these are the lies that you have riddled throughout the NIV and those are just a few examples. And, you know, I don't really spend, try to spend too much of my time reading a false version of the Bible to come up with these examples. A few of them ought to be enough. One of them ought to be enough. You see one of them, you ought to be like, Whoa, this is a book of contradictions. And when you start showing more and more and more, hey, we've got a serious problem here. And all of those problems I mentioned, not one of them is a problem in the King James Version at all. And you will not find a problem in the King James Version of the Bible. I have read many people saying, oh, there's contradictions here. Every single one has a very legitimate answer. Not even just grasping at straws. I mean very legitimate answer of just understanding what is it saying. I have not, I have to this day not seen a, contra a so-called contradiction that does not have a very legitimate valid answer. Not one. And I've looked into this quite a bit. When I, after I got saved and someone, my brother had told me about, about the King James, I looked into it because... All of a sudden, you know, oftentimes people don't even think about it. You don't really think about it a whole lot. You just say, well, I've got a Bible, I've got a Bible here. You know, someone gave me a Bible. I found my Bible. I got saved. I, you know, I'm going to read the Bible. You know, I'm going to read what, what God has to say. I had a false version, but I didn't even think about it. Like, well, I've got a Bible. What, what do you mean they're different? You know, it's a Bible. But when someone points it out to you, hey, that's real important. You want to say, am I reading Scripture? Am I reading God's Word? Hey, can that Scripture be broken? as we already broke the NIV scripture? That's not from God. That's not true scripture. It's been broken. It's been corrupted. That word, and that's why I also believe that these false versions can't save. Yeah. They can't save the lost person because that's not the word. The word needs to save somebody. The word is what needs to be sown in their heart. The word that comes from God and Jesus Christ, that's a false Jesus. That's not the word. That's a broken, corrupted scripture. That's leavened. That's a leavened body. Jesus is unleavened. He's without sin. He's perfect. He's complete. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 1. We're almost done. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to see a few more attributes of Scripture. Second Peter chapter 1. We're going to start reading in verse number 16. The Bible says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard. 
when we were with him in the Holy Mount. That's a pretty amazing event to be in anyways. This is talking about, because this is Peter. Peter was there with, um, I think he was there with James and John in the Mount when Jesus Christ was transfigured before them and he was speaking with Moses and Elijah and God's voice they heard from heaven. They were on this mountain with them. They heard the voice of God from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. They literally heard God's voice. That's pretty believable, right? To, 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 to hear it with your own ears. Look what he says in verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Even than hearing God's voice with your own ears, we have a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we see here that he's talking about the scripture is a more sure word of prophecy. This is, this is even more sure than hearing God's voice with your own ears. This is more sure than that. We could have more trust in God's written word than even just hearing something with our own ears. And he also says, look, know this, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. People say, oh, well, that's just your interpretation. No, there is no private interpretation. The book says what it says. He's not opening it up just for discussion and just, well, just, uh, you know, you believe this, you believe that, everything. Yeah, everyone just come up with your own, your own conclusions and that it's all, but it's all okay. It's all true. No, there's one truth. There's one meaning. There's no private interpretation. God's not giving us um, his words to just completely be baffled by and have no understanding and no way of knowing what it means. He's given to us in, in pretty easy to understand, to be understood language. And, um, and it's meant for us to understand. It's not meant to be... Um, you know, w when Jesus Christ was speaking, he said, Unto them I speak in parables. That seeing they may see and not perceive, and that hearing they may hear and not understand. He says, but that's not how I speak unto you. He, he clarified everything for his disciples. And he gave them, and that's what we have today. We have the scripture. It's, he's making it clear for us. He's not speaking to us in these dark sayings and these parables and these things that we can't understand. He's saying, no, I've, I'm giving you my whole word. That's why he's given us a revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the last, chap, last book of the Bible. He's revealing what needed the last thing that needed to be revealed unto us. Turn if you would to 2 Peter chapter 3, just uh, a couple chapters over. It's chapter 3. We see here Peter confirming that Paul's writings are scripture. So if you're ever wondering, kind of how do you how do you know which books of the Bible? Because the people come up with, you know, this book of Jasher and the Gospel according to Thomas and the book of Enoch and all these. Well, why is that not scripture? You know, and there's lots of different reasons. For one is, you know, scripture has to come to pass. If there's any errors or lies, if it contradicts other scripture, that's not scripture. It can't be scripture. It's not coming from God. But here we see Peter giving witness to the writings of Paul that they are scripture. Look at verse number 15. It says, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the, wit to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So he's saying here is basically saying that, look, Paul in his epistles is giving, you know, he's speaking according to the wisdom that's been given unto him. He's writing these things. And he says sometimes they're a little bit difficult to understand. Sometimes what he's writing, it's a little bit deep. It's kind of the meat of the word. And he's explaining things that, that some people have a hard time understanding but he's saying those that are unlearned, people who don't know the scripture, people who don't know the word, they rest it, they twist it, they, they, they can't get it. So, so in their trying to, uh, to, to understand it, they twist it and it doesn't, it, that's not what he's saying. They, they twist it to mean something else. And then he says, as they do also the other scriptures. So by, by putting Paul's epistles and Paul's writings in context, he's saying, those are scripture 
as well as, you know, they don't understand his as well as the other scriptures. So by saying the other scriptures, it means Paul's writings are scripture as well. This is what um, Peter is confirming to us here. And then in, um, turn if you would to Revelation 22. It's the last place we'll turn. Revelation 22. In 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 13, the Bible says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, Ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. He's, he's, he's basically praising these men saying, look, we're glad, we're thankful that when you, when you heard what we were saying to you, you didn't just receive it as, oh yeah, that's just some book written by some men. Oh, that's just your opinion. Oh, that's what these guys who didn't even have plumbing, they didn't even have a, a toilet bowl to flush in their house. These men had no, ha, 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 they're so stupid, they have no understanding. This is just, a book, this is just some book of men. Really. Maybe that NIV, that's a book of men. But this is not. This is Scripture. This is Holy Scripture of God, as it is in truth, the Word of God. Revelation 22 why is Scripture so important? Well, God thinks it is. And God puts a very, very, very serious... The, the, the most serious warning that He could give us at all about messing with His words. And that serious warning is, is basically making somebody... taking away your ability to be saved so a person will spend an eternity in hell forever and even if they're still alive on this earth, they have no chance to get saved because he's removed their place. Revelation 22, look at verse 18. The Bible says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He's saying, you better not add anything to my words and you better not take away from them. Because if you do, I'm adding plagues and your name in that book of life, gone. Done. Eternity in hell. That's a serious warning. And why is he so serious about it? Because it's the scripture that can make you wise unto salvation. It's God's word. God doesn't like people going around and saying, Thus saith the Lord, when he didn't say that. He doesn't, want, he doesn't like the liars and the false prophets that are preaching lies. And he says, Okay, this is what I said. This is the truth. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I'm giving you this word. And if you're going to corrupt it, if you're going to change it, you're going to suffer eternity in hell and you have no chance of getting saved. I am going to harden your heart. God hardens a person's heart to make them impossible to put their faith on Christ. You say, well, what if they believed? They can't. If they believed, they would be saved. But God hardens their heart so they can't be saved. And that's kind of a whole other sermon in and of itself about the reprobate. But um, God gives us that warning. Scripture is important. Obviously, it's a foundation of what we believe. It's very easy to determine. It takes some time, but it's not difficult to determine what is Scripture and what's not. It just requires you to be diligent, if you haven't done this on your own, to do it for yourself, to look up what claims to be Scripture and even comp compare it with others and compare it within itself. The NIV does not stand just as its own book of sources being Scripture. It does not stand. This does. The King James Bible stands all of the tests of whether or not it is Scripture. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the Scripture, dear God, for the written word that you have for us. God, I pray that, that something that was preached tonight will, will stick with us and help us to be able to show others for one, the, the importance of Scripture. And then, you know, sometimes there's even there's legitimate Christians that have put their faith on you. They just don't understand the big deal and the controversy over the versions, dear God, the different um, so-called versions that are out there. I pray that you would please help us to convince 
um, the naysayers and to convince these people how important this, the Holy Scripture truly is and that we have to be able to rely on your words in order to get any understanding, in order to get any uh, doctrine, in order to get any teaching. How could we believe in any doctrine at all if we don't know that we have your words to go off of? If we don't know that what we're reading is from you, God, it's, it's, it's pointless and, and the whole foundation is just built on sand. But we know that we have a rock and that you have preserved that rock and that, that, that word is here for us today and, and we have it and can hold it in our hands. And Lord, you've made it freely available to us. Help us to, to freely distribute that which we have received. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.